friends, worshippers, as we gather, I already read to you from John chapter 4 in the Passion Translation. From here on, worshipping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is a spirit and he longs to have sincere worshippers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. What an important reminder, it's not about being in the right place, but coming with a right heart. So let's come together this morning with right hearts and our minds and our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus to worship together. Father, we thank you that you invite us to worship you in spirit and in truth, with sincerity of hearts, desire to glorify you and magnify your name. Lead us, Lord, into this time where indeed uh, we may worship in a community of your people that may be scattered all over the place, but united with one heart. Bless us, God, with your presence as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We welcome Mark, who will lead us now in time of worship. Oh, 
Good morning, Church. It is so nice to have you all to join us online to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. For this morning's corporate prayer, as we gather together, we want to send our petitions to the Lord. There will be two parts to this corporate prayer. The first one, for the first one and a half minutes, we will pray for Singapore. And then they're followed by another minute or so as we pray for the world. So these are the following prayer items that we can see on the screen. For the first part, corporate prayer, we want to give thanks for the smooth elections in Singapore. Now that the elections are over, we want to pray for healing, for reconciliation, and for acceptance amongst the diverse groups. That the Lord's wisdom be upon our political leadership as well, as they formulate policies for the betterment of Singaporeans and the residents as a whole. We also to pray for wise discernment upon our leaders as they look at the implementing various policies for Singapore. We also want to pray for the Singapore economy. Now, the news are not that great. IMF forecasts that the global economy will shrink by about 4.9% for this year, and it's going to be the worst since World War II as compared to 3.3% growth that was recorded last year, or 3.6% the year before. Now, Singapore economy is not isolated. It is affected and is expected to enter into its first technical recession since first quarter 2009 as economists are forecasting a contraction of 10.5% for this year as compared to a growth of 0.7% last year. Now, let's pray for God's preservation of Singapore's status as a safe haven and for good governance in place so that investment funds will flow in to boost the economic growth, creating jobs for the people. Let us also pray for the church to be refuge in these uncertain times. As Psalms 10 verse 9 to 10 says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Let's spend about one half minutes or so praying all these items in our family groups or individually, and then we come back for the second part. Let us now spend the next minute or so to pray for the world. We pray for divine intervention to stop the global COVID-19 pandemic. Let's pray for breakthrough of vaccine to stop the virus infection and to cure the afflicted. Now 12 million people have been affected and 550,000 people dead. Let's continue to pray for selflessness and sacrifice among political and business leaders and the people at large to help to contain the second and even the possible third wave of infection. We pray for God's covering as researchers are calling for new safety measures with rising evidence that the virus can travel farther and remain in suspension longer in the air. Let's continue with our prayers.
Let us now bring our prayers to a close. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to offer to you a big thank you for the peaceful election process and the placement of selected people in Parliament. The citizens have voted, they have different aspirations and wishes, and we just want to pray for reconciliation and acceptance of these differences, and that your divine wisdom be upon the leaders to bring Singapore forward to the next level. We especially pray for the well-being of Singaporeans, that the current damage from COVID-19 to be bottomed out. And we pray for your guidance to lead Singapore to the path of recovery. We want to thank you for our past wise leaders who have laid the safe haven foundations. And we continue to ask for your favour upon Singapore, that global investors will continue to put their faith and trust upon our system. Indeed, the Church in Singapore will continue to ride on this blessing, and that in moments of uncertainties and fears, the Church continues to lift the name of the Lord high, for the Lord is refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Dear Lord, we know that COVID happened for a purpose. We just simply humble ourselves to plead for your divine intervention in bringing about a breakthrough for the vaccine development. We pray against commercialization of this vaccine, against selfishness, against greed, and against evil powers. And we just simply want to totally acknowledge that you are in control. As uncertainties still surround this coronavirus, we want to cling upon your word in Hebrews 13 verse 5. You said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we may say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. So dear Lord, please cover us with the precious blood of Christ, keeping each and every one of us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This Sunday is... Sina Sunday. Let us now sit back and watch this particular video prepared by the Sina for our viewing. Hello, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our Sina Sunday. In 2020, the world that we grew up with is forever changed. And so too is our lives, or is it? You see, as God's people, there are some things that will never change. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as His disciples, there are some things that remain the same. And one of the unchanging characteristics of Christ's disciples is that they will continue to shine His light in the darkness and continue to bear lasting fruits. And Titus tells us this very clearly. He says, I want you to especially emphasize these truths so that those who believe in God will be careful to devote themselves to doing good works. It is always beautiful and profitable for believers to do good works. And this is why for our Sinner Sunday in 2020, our theme is doing what is beautiful and profitable amidst the pandemic. And on this Sinner Sunday, we want to focus on what different Presbyterian churches are doing to impact our society for our Lord Jesus Christ. Princeps was a very unique building. We have, um, we so happen we are able to identify one room, decided to convert that room into a shelter for the home. And we named that room at Oasis. Circuit Breaker, we are not allowed to go, go out we do a catering so that the caterer will bring lunch and dinner for them. And in the fellowship hall, uh, together with CWS, we set up a television. Reverend Darrell also made another initiative. He joined the mission walk organized by the Catholic Welfare and he invited uh, our congregants. So every Friday, I think about 10 members will register and join the mission walk. We look out for those rough sleepers that are only lying there. So we will, we will give them a pack, a food pack. If they are awake, we will 
very short conversation with them. And also, we will also ask to look out for、uh, issues if they have.、Uh, 教会基本上有两个参与重重大的机构，一个就是叫做呃社区关怀服务 Care Works Community Service 啊，另外一个就是啊我们叫做啊建南之家，它是个少女收容所。所以，我们呃社区关怀服务基本上它有三大类的那个分类的施工，一就是我们那个社区中的老人家长者。家庭施工方面的话，我们啊的专注是那些。要结婚的啊，要预备婚姻的，甚至在婚上有问题的，他们也能来找我们。那么第三方面呢，就是我们探讨的一个，就是特别那个需要的那个群体，就是啊 ，special need community。前几年啊，就有了一批律师，年年轻的律师，他们说，让不然我们就从法律方面支援他们吧。Friends of the age， 我们华文称它为“松年之友”，那是教会。跟 PCS 的一个施工的合作，最主要的呃是呃我们在海格路在 Glass Line 这一区里面有大概两百多个老人是我们服务的对象，最主要是呃每一天给我社区的居民呢，给他们每一天都有不同的活动。泰国人的施工其实是在一九九五年，也是一个非常偶然的机会。我们还有一个泰人的学校。他们在这里所得到的文凭是同等于在呃泰国教育部所发的文凭，在新加坡这种背景当中，当我们投入社区的工作的时候，其实我们并不能够用这样的一个管道，要直接向居民呃传福音。我们要问自己。我们做这个工作到底是为了什么？我们做做施工不单单只是为了人数的增加。I don't have hidden agenda to increase the mem member at the church. No, not not like that. But I really want to be your friend. 啊，我们就是纯粹的，就是关心他们，按照他们的需要，提供他们呃很好的服务。It is our calling to bring out the symbols, not the from the building to the people outside who have not known God yet. 要敢敢的去想啊，敢敢的去做，人要去做，然后要最重要就是要坚持，因为你会有很长一段时间，很长一一段时间看不到那个果实。Every outreach that we do, we may not see the harvest. As I say, that God has His own timing, but we, as God's children, do not be disheartened. So, church, may we be encouraged to press on with our good works, and may our church truly be a church without walls, warmly and lovingly welcoming all people into the love of the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what makes us beautiful and profitable as God's people, especially during this difficult season. And truly, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is more than sufficient for us in all these good endeavors and good works. Amen. We shall now take up the offering, and I shall ask Sister Hazel to go through the offering process. Hello, everyone. Now we shall take up our tithes and offering. Please note that we have two separate QR code. One is for tithing, and one is for offering. For tithing, kindly scan the QR code as shown here, and we have also updated the UEN number that is for tithing. Remember to put in your tithing number in the reference section as shown in the sample. And if you do not have a tithing number or You have forgotten your tithing number. Please reach out to us via the church website, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Now for offering, kindly scan the QR code shown here and key in only the alphabet E if you're from the English service, C if you're from the Chinese service, and SL if you're from the Sri Lankan service. And now I shall give you some time to prepare your tithes and offering.
we shall now give thanks for the offering. Let us all pray. Dear Father, we want to thank you for all good things that come from you. And we want to thank you for your provision, for your blessing, for your graciousness upon each and every one of us. And we want to thank you for this opportunity that we can participate in the furtherance of your kingdom. And O oh Lord, we just pray that you bless this offering from our hearts, that we will use it, O oh Father, for your glory. For all these things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now for the announcements. The first one relates to our senior pastor, Keith Lai. And it is a great pleasure to announce that our senior pastor, Keith Lai, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church Synod, has been appointed as the new president of the National Council of Churches of Singapore on July the 9th. Now we want to extend our congratulations to him and pray for God's wisdom on him as he represents the churches in Singapore, especially in engaging with government agencies in matters that concern the church and the society. Congratulations, Pastor. The second announcement is a day alone with the Lord retreat. Now, since the circuit breaker, now we have 14 people doing a day alone with the Lord retreat in the comfort of their own homes. This will continue to take place on every last Saturday of each month in 2020. Now you can zoom in with your retreat facilitators, Reverend Keith and Mui Fong, for a briefing at 9 a.m. to start you off with the day's guided retreat material. Then you will be left for the day with the material to spend time with the Lord. Now we will gather all the returns at the end of the day together for at 5 p.m. for a debrief. So this retreat will only last from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It is free of charge and you may register for more than one retreat as this is after all a spiritual discipline of drawing near to the Lord. Join us for the next day alone with the Lord retreat on the 25th of July. You can scan this QR code to register here for more of one or more retreats and they are scheduled on July the 25th, August the 29th, September 26th, October 31st, November 28th and December the 26th. Let us now unite our hearts together to recite the discipleship DNA of Covenant Church. Together, we want to grow in Christ-likeness through devotion and delight in God, nurturing relationships and intentional multiplying of discipleship. May the Lord bless us. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back as we look into the last passage of Colossians. We're going to ask God again to guide us by His Spirit. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful that you reign supreme over us, our nation, and all that has happened. And we submit to your sovereignty this morning once again. We ask Holy Spirit be our guide, our teacher, as we look into your word. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who are basketball fans, you remember in 1992, the United States had a dream team. The Basketball Barcelona Olympics saw the coming together of all the stars, the famous basketball players that were put together and they were known as the dream team. These were all the superstars of the different teams in USA, the best of the best. And they're all famous in that they were key top players who led their own teams to victory. And of course, in 1992, they swept away all opponents and won the Olympics. But for those of us who are football fans, we like to remember 1994. That was the year when we had our dream team in the likes of uh, Fandi Ahmad and 
uh, other well-known players. They won the Malaysian Cup and it was a great time of celebration. And many of us still have fond memories of the Kalang Raw. We would be there to cheer our home team and, and it was such a fun time. Now, as we come to Colossians chapter 4 and the last passage, 7 to 18, we see here Paul had his dream team. And we want to read again from my own uh, paraphrase, a description, an introduction of Paul's dream team. Uh, starting from verse 7. My lawyer and trusted assistant, Tychicus, will bring you breaking news concerning my present situation. We are eager to hear the latest update about your lives as well. His presence will strengthen your hearts. Coming along with him is trustworthy and dear Onesimus, a truly transformed brother who comes from your city. Aristarchus, my companion in prison, says hello. Make sure you warmly welcome and embrace Mark with open arms, the cousin of Barnabas, not forgetting justice. These are my fellow Jews and the only ones who are with me 100% in spreading the good news of our King Jesus' reign. They brought me so much relief and consolation from all the stresses, distresses, and painful labor. Epaphras, who is also from your town, sends his love. What a reliable warrior, fighting tirelessly for your unwavering and solid standing in God's beautiful plan for your lives. So much has been accomplished through his intercession as he agonizes and labors painfully for you in prayer and those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And Luke, our in-house doctor, greets you, as does Demas. Thank God for Nephus, rich generosity and warm hospitality in hosting God's people in a home. From a house flows life-giving worship and love-filled fellowship. We remember our brothers in Laodicea and make sure they get this letter as well. Archippus, please stop procrastinating. My two light two key. Get on with what needs to be done. Finish your God-given assignment. I, Paul, personally wrote this greeting. My shackles are a reminder of the costly call of discipleship. Don't be fooled or misled by cheap grace. From start to finish, it is precious grace. Grace all the way and grace in all the in-between moments of life. It is grace that will help us finish well and triumphantly despite being locked up and locked down. And so here we see Paul's introduction of his dream team. The question is, what did they do together as a dream team? What made them a dream team? And first of all, we discover from Paul's repeated words in verse 7 and 12, they serve together as slaves. The word that Paul used here is doulos. And the literal meaning of doulos is slave. And a slave can come because he was hired or because he was bought from the slave market or he was taken in as a prisoner of war. And Paul names two of his fellow doulos, Tychicus and Epaphras. And Paul in verse 11 very deeply feels the support and encouragement of these two brothers. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, in ESV. In my paraphrase, I put it as the only ones, these are the only ones with me 100% in spreading the good news of our King Jesus' reign. Now the reason why I underline and highlight 
the phrase the kingdom of God is because this is what preoccupied them. This is what possessed their hearts, captured their imagination. It wasn't anything else that they were working for. It wasn't working for any party, for their own gain, but it was for the kingdom of God. See, when you look at the word kingdom, it comprises of two parts. First, there is a king and there is a dominion. In our words, the kingdom of God is about the, the reign and the rule of a king. There is someone who is running the show, who is in control, and we are, have our allegiance to is King Jesus. And that's a very important reminder for Paul and his, his team that the, the one they are serving is the King Jesus and none other. There is no other person that they submit to. He is the one who lead them into battle. He is the one who lead the charge and he's one who is in charge also. And then, the kingdom of God reminds us that the sphere of influence where we serve him is anywhere where we carry his reign. Because the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is in you. In other words, the reign of Jesus is in your hearts, your life. Which means to say that wherever we go, we carry the reign of Christ with us in the church, in the home, or in the marketplaces. On Monday, I was taking a taxi, and in that long journey, I had a good conversation with a driver, and uh, I was asking him about, uh, does he believe in Jesus? And I encourage him to pray, to have an encounter with Jesus, the, the King who is present, who is real, and you can ask him to reveal himself to you. And he was very open, even though he was from another religion. And so where we serve King is wherever he sent us, wherever we go, wherever he put us, that's where we serve the King. And then the King of God reminds us that the King has his agenda, his mandate for us found in the four Gospels and then of course in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 which is to make disciples of all nations. You know there's a group of covenanters who are now going through this local mission training conducted by Scott uh, Crawley and it has been a very refreshing time where it's, we meet in small group and then as a bigger group and we are to do different uh, DBS Bible studies, we are to have conversation with different people, uh, whether it's casual, meaningful, uh, to the curious. And then we are supposed to read and have been reading this book called Contagious Disciple Making. And what was very helpful for me is to be reminded again that the king's agenda is about making disciples, but it doesn't stop there. We are to go on to make disciples to the second, third, and the fourth generation. Something that we've seen happen as our church went to Sri Lanka and started a TNAP, they are now going into the fourth generation. You see, the king's agenda has not changed all this year. We don't have to come up with a new vision of what the church should do or not do. The king has already spelled out for all of us what is the purpose of his dream team, his agenda. And that is to make disciples who will go on to make disciples. We don't stop by just making the first generation of disciples. We go on making more and more disciples. And then next, we learn that as they serve as slaves, as doulos of the king, how do they go about serving the king? How do they serve as slaves? The first thing that we here repeated in this passage is Paul referred to his fellow uh, workers as faithful servants, faithful slaves, faithful workers. And this word means trustworthy, reliable, people who will not quit on you, people who will go the extra mile, people that you can uh, bet your life on and, and know that they'll be there to cover you, cover your back. 
No matter whether, whatever you go through, bad times, good times, they are there for you. Faithfulness is what Paul put a high premium on. Faithfulness to the very end. And the second thing that Paul highlights about these slaves is in how they were resourceful in using their possessions, in using their uh, gifts and talents for the purpose of the king. And Paul highlights especially this lady called Nymphus, and to Nymphus and the church in her house. And I paraphrase it this way. Thank God for Nymphus' rich generosity and warm hospitality in hosting God's people in her home. And from her house flows life-giving worship and love-filled fellowship. Nymphus was an example, and she's not the only one. You read in, in Romans, there are others who open up their homes to be a place of gathering for God's people. You see, the word church doesn't refer to building. The word is made of two Greek words, ecclesia, call out of, to become a community of believers. It has nothing to do with a building. The church is not a fixed location. The, the church is the gathering of God's people wherever they meet. And that's why Paul can say uh, to Nymphus, the church in your house. And he was so thankful for her. You know, what has challenged us during this COVID-19 pandemic is to rethink what church is all about. We are so used to the traditional understanding that we go to church, we go to a address somewhere and where the church is found. But now with the pandemic, there is no more place that we can go to that is called the church. And it's a very important resetting and rethinking of what church should look like. And I believe God is calling his people back to the wine skin for the church. You know, we often say this is a new wine skin. It's actually not new because in, a, in Paul's time, the church was found in homes, in houses, not in the buildings. I'd like to introduce to you that there's a church that meets often, different groups of people meeting at Mike and Elena's house. And here you can see two different groups and it's always centered around the meal, right? This is very important. Uh, food fellowship. And I'm quite amazed at how Mike and Elena's house is so well designed to cater for hospitality and entertainment, to, to reach out to other people, to provide a safe haven for people to come and just chill out. As you can see the picture on your left, while the adults enjoying the meal, the children have a little corner to chill out. Of course, the latest group that went was the Yaya, the young adult leaders who went there and had a very nice time. And I'm so encouraged that, you know, they are people, my and Elena, are people who believe in using their home it's a gathering of God's people. And wherever God's people gather, Jesus says, I am with you in your midst. This is what church is like. Of course, it doesn't always have to be a serious Bible study and worship, but just the coming together to encourage each other with whatever gifts we come with, whatever encouragement and sharing we come with. This is what it's like for us to be church. And, and I want us to seriously consider, you know, uh, doing up your church, re, you know, organize your, your home into a place where you can always invite people to come over for a meal and, and, and become a church. And then share the meal and, and begin with the Holy Communion. So Paul's dream team are people who serve as slaves. They are doulos in the service of the king. But then, they go on also to be soldier who struggle together. The word that is used uh, by Paul is agonizomai. And very quickly you can pick up, there's something close to an English word that says agonize. 
And English is translated wrestle, fight, and agonize. And this is not the first time in chapter 4, verse 12, that he uses this word of Epaphras. Because Paul himself in chapter 1, verse 29, talked about how he struggled, he agonized with all the energy that God provides for the maturity of the Colossians. Now, this term is an image of an athletic contest or warfare. It means making effort, striving with intensity, tireless exertion, struggling all right, uh, with, against all kinds of setbacks and opposition. You see, we have to be very clear about ministry is not without pain, without struggle, and intensity. Ministry sometimes is, is, is about warfare, about fighting and engaging the enemy. And Paul has this to say about Epaphras, he was a reliable warrior. You can count on him to cover your back. You can count on him to be the watchman fighting for us, fighting for our spiritual growth and health. And he accomplished so much through his intercession. That's what he believed will bring about transformation. During the COVID season, uh, someone sent me this article. In fact, it was Scott Crawley about this uh, OMF missionary called James Fraser. He was an engineer, successful in his time, and uh, concert pianist, but he left it all behind and went to China to be a missionary. And he served in a place near Wuhan among the Lisu people in Lisu land. And people who study missions, they are missiologists, would trace back the enormous revival that has swept through China in the past 50 years to the revival that began among the highlanders of the Lisu land during the winters when he stayed at home and prayed. You see, James Fraser he used to have this belief about the importance of teaching the Word of God. But then he found this new revelation. He says, I used to think that prayer should have the first place and teaching the second. I now feel that it would be truer to give prayer the first second and third place and teaching the fourth wow what a transformation huh what a change in his mindset what happened well see it was during his years when he was in the highland when he would travel often and it takes three days of trekking through the mountains to reach these people in the highland and then over the weekend he will conduct a service do bible studies and then come back to his own home, home base. But there was one winter in particular where the snowstorm was so severe that he couldn't travel to these people. So he couldn't have a Bible study and hold services for them. And so he was very worried, very concerned. But it was at that time that God challenged him about prayer. And so instead of Traveling back and forth, he took those times to just persevere in prayer and spiritual warfare for these Lisu people. At the same time, he was still worried, will these people fall away because they are into idolatry and superstition, animism? And so he, at the same time, was very concerned. So he couldn't wait until when things were cleared and he could travel back to check and find out how things are. And the day finally came when he was able to go back and to his pleasant surprise, he discovered that these Lisu people have, have grown spiritually. They become more spiritual alive during his absence. And through his prayer, he saw a breakthrough. He was writing to his mother, who is uh, his chief intercessor. And he encouraged her to tell his band of intercessors to make prayer the number one priority. This is what he wrote in the newsletter. He says, I'm not asking you 
to just give help in prayer as a sort of sideline. I mean, something that is secondary. But I'm trying to roll the main responsibility of this prayer warfare on you. I want you to take the burden of these people upon your shoulders. I want you to wrestle with God for them. It sounds very much like Epaphras. He wanted more intercessors who will wrestle in prayer and fight in a spiritual warfare on behalf of these least people. Because to him, this is what will bring about breakthrough. And true enough, in his career, in a, uh, and during his time with the Lisupi, he saw amazing revival. Of the 730,000 in southern China, over 300,000 are Christians. You can read more about his uh, life story from the biography written by his daughter and titled Mountain Rain. And so James Fraser is very much like what Paul says of Epaphras, who wrestled in prayer and saw amazing breakthrough. So Paul's dream team served as slaves. They fought and struggled as soldiers. And then thirdly, they supported each other as servants. The word translated servants is diakonos. Of course, you're familiar is that's where we get the word deacon. And so it's very different from the word doulos that Paul used earlier that referred to literal slaves. Here, Paul is talking about servants. And what do servants do? In verse 11, Paul says they have been a comfort. They brought relief. In paraphrase, I'm trying to bring out the, the meaning of the word comfort. They brought me so much relief and consolation from all the de uh, stresses, distresses, and painful labor. Paul was thankful for these servants who came alongside him and supported him and strengthened him. Many of us don't realize that Paul was one who got discouraged. There were times when he was so weary and fatigued and discouraged by the opposition. And this fellow servants came and ministered to him, came and brought him the comfort that he needed to relieve him and console him in the midst of those dark times. These are people that have been entrusted to meet the needs of believers, to comfort, to relieve, sustaining, standing together. And Paul is thankful for such people. You know, throughout Covenant, I'm so thankful that there are so many dream teams. Uh, and sometimes they do things very quietly without being known. And during the COVID, there was one live group that came together and raised uh, 3000 over dollars to support two uh, persons that they know who are in need. And there are so many more. I, 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 I'm sure that it, it happened without many of us noticing. God's teams of, of people who are bringing uh, support and relief to God's people in a very quiet way. And we praise God and thank God for all these dream teams. And so in Paul's dream teams, they were people who served together as slaves, they struggled as soldiers, and they support and comfort one another as servants. But what kind of people are these team players? What are they like? And this is where it may surprise all of us. We will think that Paul's dream team are all the high flyers, the high performers, the super achievers, the, the flawless team that everyone knows exactly what they do. They get along very well. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's not true. Paul's dream team consists of a whole spectrum of people who are totally different in personality, in gifting. And so first of all, we discover in Paul's dream team, there are those who are very loyal, trusted, reliable. And Paul would highlight Barnabas, who was the steady, encouraging brother. But then there is also a person called Mark, who was fickle was unsteady during times of crisis. 
Now, if you remember, it happened in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas, they came to a point where they had such a huge, sharp disagreement over Mark. Why was that so? Because there was a certain point in their missionary travel when Mark just left the team. He just dropped the ball. You know, he threw in the towel and he just abandoned the team. And Paul has such a uh, bad impression that, that the next time they came together, Paul told Barnabas, no way am I going to take this guy, Mark. It is totally unreliable. And the argument became so heated that they parted ways. Two spiritual giants, right? Paul and Barnabas, they went their separate ways all because of Mark. You see, in Paul's team, it's a mixed bag of people. There are those who are loyal, but then there are those who are fickle. And then there are also those who are hardworking, and then the procrastinator. Remember, Archippus, Paul says, my two lie, two key, huh? stop pushing the buck, uh, and stop uh, procrastinating, stop dilly-dallying, right? Get on with the job. But, you know, there's of Paul's dream team. You have people like this. Epaphras, on the other hand, was hardworking. And then in Paul's dream team, you have those who are outstanding. You have Dr. Luke, you know, who is very prominent, the gospel writer, and then record the history of the early church in Acts. But then you also have those who are overlooked. Where in the eyes of the world, they will be, well, disqualified. They will be cut off. And of course, Paul mentioned this runaway slave, Onesimus. So does it surprise you and me that in Paul's dream team, you have such a, a mixed group of people? Precisely. This is God's way of putting together his dream team. And we should not be surprised because Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. I like the way Eugene Pearson phrased it. He chose nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That has always been God's mode of operation. That has always been the way he operates in bringing people who are of no uh, high standing in society, who will be discounted and disqualified easily. And yet, these are the very ones that God will choose to be on His team. And so the question before us is, who qualifies us to be on Christ's dream team? What is it that will make us suitable to serve in His dream team? There's only one word that can summarize what will qualify us to be on his team. And it's the word grace. As we come to the end of the book, uh, the letter in uh, Colossians, Paul ends with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And if you remember, when Paul started the letter, he began with the same greeting. Grace to you. Now, in the biblical writer's experience, they have this literary device that they use called inclusio. Inclusio is the intentional repetition of clearly recognizable truth at the beginning and end. In the middle is an explanation of this truth. And so this is what you'll see. Paul begins in chapter 1, verse 2, grace to you. And then in the middle, in chapter 1, verse 6, since the day you heard 
and understood the grace of God in truth. And then he ends in chapter 4, grace be with you. And so is the entire uh, New Testament, Revelation 22, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And so what is this inclusio? It means that from beginning to end, as I paraphrase uh, the text, from beginning to end, it is precious grace. It is grace in all the in-betweens moments of our lives. It is grace that will sustain us all the way so that we will finish well and triumphantly. It is grace that qualifies us to be on Christ's dream team. One of the movies that I had a chance to watch during the lockdown was Winston Churchill's Darkest Hour. I'm always fascinated by Winston Churchill because if you know about a bit about his life, he struggled with this bipolar depression. There's this extreme swing of moods. And yet he was chosen to be the Prime Minister of England during the most difficult years of World War II. And in this movie, it captured the uh, few days just before uh, he gave his famous speech in Parliament that says, we shall fight on the beaches, you know, we shall fight on the landing, and we will fight in the streets, and we will never surrender. But this movie brings out that moment in Winston Churchill's life was it was the darkest, the most depressing. And what happened was, this was a time when Hitler's forces were just taking country after country, France, and now next they are on, on the verge of uh, invading England. And Churchill was faced with opposition in his parliament, not just from the opposing party, but from within his own party, who were persuading him, come on, let's sit down and, and negotiate with Hitler to come to an agreement. And Winston was very insistent, no, we can't do that. And in his darkest hour, he, he went to the streets and hear the heartbeat of the English people. They sit down and negotiate with Hitler and all of them with their resounding agreement says, no, we will not. We will not surrender. And then the final moment uh, in this movie was when Churchill was still struggling and in his bunk, he was sitting there, he was looking very depressed in the dark room. And the wife came in and said these words to him. said, these inner battles have actually trained you for this very moment. These inner battles, which means all the uh, emotional turmoil that he goes through, all the opposition that he's facing right now, is actually preparing him to rise up, to stand up. You are strong because you are imperfect. And you are wise because you have doubts. Thank God for wise, discerning wives. And Winston Churchill's wife gave him the boost that he needed that propelled him to stand up and spoke powerfully, inspiring the whole nation to rise up. You are strong because you are imperfect. You are wise because you have doubts. And it's so true it? of the way that God would choose you and I, that we are imperfect. And yet, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. We have doubts. We have questions about who am I, Lord, to be put in this position? And as you know, you know I'm put into even more responsibility. And, and I've been asking God, why at this time, you know, why in this particular moment am I given this? I have a lot of doubts. I have a lot of struggles. But this message in, is, is meant for me to encourage me that God use the nobodies to confound the somebodies. And so my challenge to all of us is 
Are you struggling to believe that God can actually use you on his team? You may have made bad choices, wrong decisions. You may have setbacks. But God is a God of another chance. He's always calling people who are down and out so that he connect with the down and out. He's calling us who are broken so that we will be wounded healers for him. And so don't be looking at yourself, but look at the God who is calling you to be on his team. The second challenge I want us to take to heart is this. Can we make a commitment again about the importance of prayer? That epiphrase that we will agonize and travail and wrestle in prayer for one another, for the church, for our nation. You know, I struggle with just being consistent in prayer. And I need to find a way how I can be reminded of the importance and the priority of prayer. And so what I do is I'll set my alarm at 12 p.m., 12 noon, every day. And when it rings, I know I have to drop everything and just be in God's presence in prayer. I would encourage you to find whatever will help you to carve out time to make prayer a priority because it's really prayer that makes the difference. And God's grace through us as we engage in spiritual warfare, as we plead and wrestle for the welfare of others, that God's breakthrough will come. Amen? So let's pray together as we come together in these final moments. So Father, we pray that you will help us that as we come to the end of this wonderful book, Colossians, that you would reinstate us, God, and put us back on your dream team. Forgive us, Lord, for uh, abdicating and, and, and shirking our responsibility, for, for forsaking that position that you put us in. Help us to put our hands to a plow and not look back, Lord, and, and volunteer and be on that dream team that you have chosen us to be, Lord. Thank you, Father. May your grace abound in us, God. Grace upon grace, favor upon favor. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Your glory may be seen in
Let's come now in preparation for the Holy Communion. We come and we reminded that because of His grace, we are able to receive His goodness, His forgiveness, His cleansing. And we come to His table because He invites us and He prepared this table for us to receive His grace in a fresh and new way. And each time we come, we come with thankfulness. We come as children in need of the Father's touch, in need of Christ's healing grace. And the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave to the disciples. And he said to them, take and eat. This is my body given to you. For as often as you eat this bread, you do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, the Lord Jesus uh, took the cup and he said to them, drink all of this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, pour out for the forgiveness of your sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. Father, we ask right now you sanctify the simple elements for holy use. May your Holy Spirit come upon us as we eat and drink in remembrance of Christ and His goodness and, and grace. Thank you. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, let's eat together and give thanks in our hearts. And this cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Pour out for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's drink together and give thanks. Let's pray together. Let's receive the word of his blessing. So, Father, we enthrone you as our matchless king, the reigning king over Singapore. And we declare that you would reign over us as your people in all the churches gathered. Continue, Lord, your rule in and through us, that wherever we go, we may carry this wonderful good news of your goodness and mercy. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rests on you this day and forevermore. Amen. So brothers and sisters in Christ, have a wonderful week ahead. Remember, wherever you go, you carry the reign of Christ in you. Amen. Amen.